name is Mike Dawes and welcome to our first Brooklyn's Members Talk of 2022. Live, online and available to catch up via the museum website. Wonderful to see so many people here this evening and thank you all for, for wearing masks if you're able to do so. The new year brings a new head to our talks team. After seven wonderful years of delivering high quality, informative and entertaining members' talks, Steve Clark is now taking a well-earned retirement. Harry Sherrard has stepped up to take his place and he will be familiar to a number of our regulars for presentations that in recent times. Tonight, he will be in conversation with our star guest, Tiff Nidell. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to put your hands together to welcome the racing driver, the media star, the corporate entertainer, Tiff Nidell. Thank you, Mike. Thank you again, everyone, for coming along this evening. Am I mic'd up? Yes, I can hear that my, my mic is working. So thank you very much for coming along, Tiff. The members have been wanting to hear from you for, uh, for quite a few years. I can't understand why, but... You know. <laughs> so, yeah, so it's great to have you here. So I thought before we get on to your story, we'd go back a couple of generations and start in a very appropriate place. Obviously, Brooklyn's now... Not many people will necessarily realise that your father actually competed here at Brooklyn. There he is. Uh, and here, here he is in his little fit. Uh, dad in his mum's fit. Because dad, dad... That's his younger sister in the, in the passenger seat. Oh, it's his younger sister, and I thought possibly it was your mother. I thought oh, there would no, be no, two no, generations no. going on here now. So, yeah, uh, so just a few hundred yards from where we're sitting, actually, here doing an auto test. Yeah, he lived just down the road. He came to this area to uh, work for the Fairmile um, boat mob, uh, most torpedo boats. He's a naval architect by trade, loved boats, but he came to live in Weybridge, I don't know, in the, in the early 30s to take this job. And uh, while designing the boats at Fair Mile, he started to be lured to Brooklands to watch those amazing aero engine devices blasting round. Uh, so that's what started the Nidell passion for, for motorsport. And then, uh, as you can see, he <laughs> took part in some slightly less dramatic competitions. Uh, whilst at the same time, during the war, designing motor torpedo boats and, and guarding Weybridge Post Office as part of the Home Guard. <laughs> and uh, he always laughed about the time when the first time halfway through the war, they actually gave him one bullet for his rifle. Which he'd, <laughs> he'd guarded the post office with just the bayonet for about two years, and they finally gave him one bullet. Whether that was to commit suicide or not on the invasion, or to try and shoot <laughs> one person, I'm not sure. So uh, the Nidells arrived in Weybridge in the, in the mid-30s. So if we, if we jump on now to, to, the, to the post-war years, now I'm sure a lot of people here have tickets for the 79th members meeting at Goodwood, and here we have your father competing in the very first <laughs> members meeting at Goodwood in uh, 1949. Cool shades though, cool shades, you've got to admit, look at that. Yeah, because he's, um, you know, obviously the motorsport ended at Brooklands with the war, and then after the war, Goodwood became the new Brooklands when the BARC moved down there. And uh, yeah, Dad was out there, and he's like, it's an old Ford. I don't know what it is, to be honest. I always forget what it is. Well, it says in your book it's a Ford V8. So. It was a Ford. It was something yeah. like that, anyway. Yeah. And he, they did these three lap races, you know, handicap as well. And I've got the results somewhere, and I think he started the middle of the pack and got overtaken before the end of the three lap race. Uh, but of course, then he started a young family. My elder brother was born in 1948, and uh, that's when the mother said that motor racing ends. And um, so sadly, it was a very short racing career. Not that he could afford to do it anyway, whilst he continued to be a bankrupt um, naval architect. So we, we were talking about it earlier. We, we think this is Woodcote, probably. So the, the shell building is probably here, I think just off to the right. But uh, obviously, it looks very, very different uh, to the Goodwood that we know uh, today. But as you mentioned earlier, you, you, you lived very near here, and I think as a teenager you came down, obviously the museum and everything wasn't active in those days, but you came down to Brooklands to, to play as a, as a yeah, teenager. Yeah, kids all the time. So I was actually born in Havant. Everyone says I was born in Havant, Hampshire, which I was, because my mother's mother uh, lived in Havant. And uh, in those days it was more common that the wife disappeared to her mother's house to uh, have the babies, because us dads didn't get involved, which is probably a good thing, really. But now we're forced to come <laughs> watch all these goings-on, which we probably wouldn't want to, really. But... Uh, so I was actually born in Haven where my uh, grandmother lived, and, uh, but as soon as I was about three months old, I was brought home to, to live here in, in Weybridge uh, in, in five Oatlands Mere, Oatlands Drive, a big old a block of flats, which was so cold in the winter. People were coming about cold now. I can remember we used to put about five blankets on and go to bed with three jumpers, and uh, it was a big old building where there's now a lovely housing estate, and... Uh, 
I said, my dad was brilliant. I don't understand why he was bankrupt, because he was that useless with money. Because um, we moved into Weybridge in 1948 or 9, rented this flat, and uh, we stayed in that same flat uh, for about 20 years throughout the 60s and 70s, because he, he didn't want one of these mortgage things. He probably couldn't have got one anyway, because he was always in the red. But well, I think he could have bought an acre of Weybridge for £1,000. It'd be worth a million pounds by now. But... Uh, so, yeah, we lived in a rented flat in Oatlands Mere for all those years. But it was a lovely place to grow up. And, of course, one of the attractions, you know, was Brooklyn's. You know, so my dad had told me about it and told his stories. And uh, so we used to cycle down to the outside of the banking and crawl up through the woods, look over the top and watch out for the um, security guards. And what was the couple of British heiress before British heiress? was, was um, Vickers, wasn't it? Vickers, yeah. And uh, we'd keep an eye out for the security guards. And when they weren't around, we'd slide down the banking and do as much mischief as we could until we were, someone spotted a security guard and then we scrambled up the banking as quick as we could. We soon learned that hobnailed boots, they couldn't catch us very well get up the banking, so we could usually outrun them. But uh, it's a lot, and also we, under, under the Hennepin Bridge, we used to walk across the, the concrete uh, beams and uh, so had a lot of fun at Brooklands, not watching any motorsport, but uh, just mucking around as kids. Mm. So, uh, so fast forwarding that a, f a few years, you, you got the motor racing bug by, uh, by watching it at Goodwood mainly, you, you, you were telling us, and uh, obviously it was a dream to go to be able to go racing, but couldn't afford to. No, that's well, I know, as soon as I take the Goodwood, your dad took us, you know, the family. We had Austin, we had Austin 7s, we hadn't even had a car for it. And I love, to, I love telling these silly stories, because it's the old, um, you know, I, we licked tarmac off road, you know, I, we, were, we were lucky. <laughs> So I always remember we had no fridge and no car and no television and, you know, it's amazing what the 50s, early 50s, you know, mid 50s, uh, these are all things a lot of families didn't have. Uh, and eventually we started buying a car because the Ford broke down that used to take us to Goodwood at first. And I was about three or four years old when I first went to Goodwood and as soon as I climbed the bank on the exit of the Woodcote Chicane, that's still there, the famous chicane, from that first time I peered over the top and saw these loud, smelly, noisy, colourful cars being wrestled through the corners, uh, all I wanted to be was a racing driver, you know, and uh, that was where I was inspired. And we went to every Easter Monday meeting, and eventually after Dad's four broke down, we bought Austin 7s. And I always remember the price. Mum used to buy them for 10 quid, because um, they were 1936, 37 Austin, Austin rubies. And I still remember we used to stop at the beginning of the South Downs on the way to Goodwood to fill up with water before the family Austin 7 would try to get over the top to go and watch the racing at Goodwood. So wonderful memories. And yeah, I watched Sterling Moss and Mike Hawthorne. I was there when you know, Sterling crashed and all that went on. And, but Jim Clark was my biggest hero. I watched his first single-seater race in that lovely Lotus 18. And that became me a Lotus Clark fan for the rest of my life. That was you know, my biggest inspiration. But I uh, never really thought I'd be a racing driver, but um, somehow I got to be one. Well, and we, we all know the, the very famous story then of how you entered the autosport competition. And uh, lo and behold, uh, you became the, the, the winner and uh, you won the, uh, the Lotus Formula Ford. There's a lovely fifth gear story. They're all on YouTube, these stories you want to look. We, we pointed out, I did a complete recreation of that picture because that is the magazine that I entered the competition in. So that's the inside of the entry form. And... Uh, I eventually won this magazine competition, won that very car, and the trailer, again, that film you just saw on Love Cars, that's on Love Cars, the whole history of it, I towed it home with a Morris Thousand Traveller. But we recreated that very image. That little tiny tree on the left is now a huge oak tree or something. And it was quite uh, fun to go back up to Hethel and to recreate that. Um, and th th this guy looks like an early incarnation of the Stig. <laughs> yeah, that was really. Maybe that's, that's how it was supposed to be. So yeah, I entered this competition. It, it, was, it was a competition. That lots of those uh, 60s and early 70s competitions about putting things in order of importance and used to buy a column. It could be a Daz, you know, soap, what, what makes Daz whiter and you come out with 10 reasons you want a holiday in Tenerife or something. Uh, and I entered about 20 lines of this competition and somehow I came out with the right line that matched the expert judges line of how to prepare a car for a race. Uh, and, you know, won this amazing Formula Ford. I was 19 years old. Um, and by then, we were living in my, in my granny's house. In, we'd moved into Weybridge, another house. We were actually with my granny. It was her house now. Um, and I still remember the time. There were two things. First of all, when the phone rang, I was watching Olivia Newton-John singing, If Not For You. <laughs> it's a genuine story. And the phone was ringing. I hope mum would answer, because I was so lusting after Olivia Newton-John singing in that velvet catsuit she wore at the time. 
And the flipping phone was ringing. And so, Mum, nobody answered. So I had to pick up the phone. And, and the, the voice just said, oh, this is Simon Taylor from Autosport. You're a very lucky man. And the, I didn't remember anything after that. I was just... I've got a little tickle in my throat now in tears. It was just so weird and iconic. And he waffled on about, I don't know, picking the... I had to phone him back the next day to sort of say, was that true <laughs> almost? I was, so I went down the pub and got pissed in the Flint Gate in, in, <laughs> in Oakland's Village, our favourite pub. And my mate suddenly pointed out, well, when it's being announced, it's, it's April the 1st next Thursday. Are you sure it's... A, <laughs> But um, and my, my granny, because it was a popular thing in those days, straight away said, of course it's one of those competitions where you can take the money or the prize, isn't it? <laughs> so I think granny thought I'd take the money and not the car, but uh, she was wrong. <laughs> and, uh, and there it was. So, you know, and all I owned then was a Morris Thousand Traveller, which um, I had to try and tow it on a brand new trailer, again, as I recreated that story just last year on, on Love Cars. So it was quite a thing to suddenly be the owner of this gleaming racing. I was a civil engineer. I, was a, I started um, university doing a five-year sandwich degree course in civil engineering, uh, which meant I was out working every, winter, every summer, getting work experience. And then in winter, I was at university. So it was actually quite handy, because I was being paid money so I could set off and almost be a racing driver on my wonderful salary of £450 a year. <laughs> And it's crazy, it's all Monty Python stuff. Isn't it? When you look back, to, I mean, of course, it was just about mid 70s when the pound went crazy. And, but early 70s, you know, the money was so stupid. We were you know, taking home 45 pounds a month. In fact, I remember now when I, before I won the car, my first um, summer away doing work experience, doing housing estates for George Wimpy and Company, was my sponsor as a civil engineer. And uh, I'd rented, a, a, I was doing these races at the racing driver's school in Brands. So before I won this, I'd actually still gone with all my money that I'd saved from being a postman and a kind of washing people's cars, borrowed Mum's Morris Thousand then to drive to brands and do the school races. And those school races were, I think it was 30 quid a race. And I think I rented a flat in Chelmsford, Essex for £10 a month. So that was 40 of my £45 take-home money. <laughs> and I used to hitchhike home from Chelmsford and jump through the train stations and get on the free on the train to come home to Weybridge to eat money and borrow mum's Boris thousand. So I used to live on five pounds a month in 1970, and it's just such crazy money now. You have to multiply by 20 to make it real money. But um, there were a lot of sacrifices going on with this dream to try and come true. But I like I got a sponsor. A friend gave me 10 pounds per race, and I took him with me. And so uh, you know, for the next five years, I was a mechanic in my little lock-up garage in Weybridge that I borrowed off someone and, and, then, and then the weekend you know I was the van driver the mechanic and the racing driver we used to we used to set off with the Morris Thousand and the trailer at about 3 a.m. to get to Sneston for races and it was an amazing time we were racing virtually every weekend because Formula Ford then was a bit like the karting of today because it was where you started motorsport karting was a fun thing in the, in the late 60s early 70s it wasn't a serious motorsport um, so Formula 4 was where every driver began. And we'd have a race every weekend. I mean, you could have a club race, and there were 30 or 40 cars. There were three national championships by the mid-1970s that we'd do all three of them. So it was an amazing amount of racing. And uh, I was just in my van with my mate, and, you know, we'd drive for the race, crash won or lost, and drive home and have a pint of bitter on the way home, whether you lost or won. And uh, it was just a fantastic time. And uh, I don't think every racing series will be the same. So now with karting, you have to have a parent with you. You know, in those days, you had to have a driving license in order to be a racing driver. So um, we could take ourselves to races. But uh, now, of course, dads take the kids and you can't, can't race. They're racing Formula Fords when they're 14 or 15 now, aren't they? I think so, yeah. So um, you have to have a parent with you and have to be a very rich parent nowadays. <laughs> Because the so great thing, they were so simple to run, the suspension, you could actually, you know, I was then a mechanic myself, and you could be competitive uh, setting up the car yourself and just using your driving skills that older cars tend to be more driver than, than chassis. But now these Formula Fords are so precise, these young single-seater drivers, if the suspension's two millimetres wrong in ride height or the preload in the suspension is a pound or two out, you just can't drive the car around the corners. You can't drive around a bad chassis. Whereas the beauty of those days, you could. So, yeah, I mean, I, I did all that myself, Formula Ford over the year, and that, that, that was the bit of your book, I must have said, that I enjoyed the most, actually. Yeah. Your, uh, your Formula Ford years are fantastic, and as you said, uh, great learning. Uh, yeah. 
for, uh, for your, your uh, later career. So onwards and upwards, after a lot of success in Formula Ford, including racing at Crosley, uh, which, which I yeah. actually raced for many, many years as well, um, you then found yourself a, a Formula 3 drive. <laughs> and here you are on the, on the front row alongside no less a person than the future world champion Alain Prost. Oh, if only it was the front row. If only. <laughs> <laughs> It's a lovely story because I did a Formula Ford and then a Formula Ford 2000 and uh, in 1976 I was voted the most promising young British driver and got a great award from James Hunt, a thousand pound cheque. Of course that was the original, cause same as the Autosport Awards now, so the same the national, the annual thing. So it was my big year, 1976. Um, nowadays they get £200,000, so they get a bit more than I got. But um, thanks to that award and my results in Formula Ford, I was picked up to drive in this Unipart Formula 3 team, which had to have the Dolomite Sprint engine, British lane. And I've got to be a bit careful what I say next, because the, the marketing officer from Unipart is in the audience now. <laughs> But he knows the trials we went through because unfortunately the Dolomite Sprint engine wasn't a match for the Toyota that dominated Formula 3 in 77, 78. So we're actually sharing about the fifth or sixth row at Dijon. We battled away. We finished um, ninth and tenth, I think, in the final. Unfortunately, he beat me. But uh, it's quite lovely. We're both in sort of, you know, nationally backed cars, but uh, struggling to, to, to win races. But... Uh, it was a great time. Well, it, was the, it got me being a professional. That was the thing, you know. Up until the end of 1976, I was still a civil engineer, full time. I'd finished my training, got my degree, and I was working up in Hammersmith doing structural design. So, you know, I'm 25 years old. I was still a professional, you know, working. I mean, nowadays these kids, they, you know, they don't work at all. They just daddy's money. So, it was actually the Unipart team that turned me to professional driving because they actually paid me to race. I became a retired civil engineer in 1977 and got uh, loaned a lovely TR7 sports car painted out in uh, white with the red and blue flashes. So it was a huge, huge move for me because it, it got me out of uh, you know, the, the rat race of club racing. Now, as you said, the, the Dolomite engine wasn't so great and uh, you then voluntarily um, left the team. Now, re remind me, who, who was that guy who took your drive over the following season? I don't know. What's his name? Well, a lot of people, because when I was, I was, it was announced I was going to leave the Unipart Formula 3 team, and so a lot of people were phoning about, well, how do I get the drive? It was still a great drive, because it was a paid drive. It wasn't, they weren't winning. We were second and third, we were there, but not oh, frustratingly close to winning. But one voice that phoned me up was this sort of slightly Birmingham accent, said, that, well, that guy, yeah. My yeah. name's Nigel Mansell, I want your drive, how do I get it? <laughs> oh. And uh, I gave him the same advice as I gave all the other English and British drivers that, that phoned up to try and uh, get the drive. But it was Nigel that got my drive, and my TR7 as well, and nicked it. <laughs> and what? Nigel couldn't win it neither, so um, he actually won one race. I was quite annoyed with it, actually, because he finished second on the road, but the winner got disqualified. So uh, he did actually technically win one race, but not on the road, so... Uh, so even Nigel couldn't quite get there, but we're, we're both so grateful, you know, for that happy to that happen. You know, Nigel, Nigel actually sold his house and raced in Formula Three, spent his own money. Um, not that I didn't have a house to sell. So I mean, you know, they always says oh, Nigel was great. He sold his house. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, but his career had gone downwards, you know, without Unipart. You know, I would think Nigel's uh, career would also have faltered. So um, it's funny how these little, little twists of your life that take on. So onwards and upwards, and uh, you've had a few interesting sponsors in your career. Well, yes. Well, yeah. <laughs> well you see, that was why I left Unipart, because I'd done two years of Formula 3, and I'd finished you know, fourth of the championship and things, you know, I'd finished fourth the year when... Um, uh, Nelson Piquet won it, Derek Warwick was it, it was a really competitive year, 1978. But this scholarship came up to race in the British Formula One Championship, obviously not, not Grand Prix racing, it was a wonderful Aurora series that uh, did mainly British races, a couple of races on the continent. Uh, and of course it was a scholarship that was spe specifically intended for up and coming young drivers. I haven't got that joke, I didn't, obviously I didn't deliver it. <laughs> It was a sponsorship specifically intended for up and coming got down it, drive. Got it. I think everybody got it. Um, but, yeah. you know, it was, again, it was, it was an older car. A lot of my career, you, know, you, can't, you can't always blend the cars. You have to get the best cars but sometimes. And that was an older, it was about two years out of date. Um, but it was a wonderful opportunity because I got to drive a DFV Formula 1 engine and I finished second in my first race in it in Zolder. So I was, you know, got a good result first time out. And uh, 
so it, it caught the eye of the Formula One team managers even more, and so that was what really gave me the, the lift up into to being a Grand Prix driver. So it was still a wonderful year. So it's cer- certainly un- unthinkable these days. I mean, I'm sure younger people in the audience don't realise there was such a thing as a national Formula One championship yeah. that it was feasible to run cars yeah. privately. Yeah. Obviously, uh, these days the complexity of such a thing would be. This was one man awesome. ran this, Graham Eden, who was a racing driver, amazing mechanic himself, and uh, he rebuilt the DFE engine, ran the whole car himself. And yeah, when I, when, I, when I finished, he brought a fireman with him to help out when we went to Belgium and sold when I had this second place, you know. But it was him, the fireman, and me loading the truck up with the wheels and tyres at the end of the race, you know. And it's even that was like a Formula Ford affair compared with modern, modern motorsport. So, of course, the, the call then came also with the Unipark connection, and uh, I think here you are at Zolder then for your, your Grand Prix debut in, uh, in, in 1980 in the, in the end sign. Yeah. This was the one that made the whole career so much more uh, enjoyable in a way. Just to be a Grand Prix driver. It was only for one race, although I tried to qualify at Monaco. And, uh, but unfortunately, it was tragedy because Clay Regazzoni, that was going to drive this car for the whole year, had this awful accident at Long Beach, which you know, paralysed him from the waist down. And uh, after uh, that, they were looking for a young driver. Mike Fackwell tested the car for a day at Zolder. And obviously, my name was in the frame, thanks to Unipart, reminding them I was around and I'd driven the Chevron. I mean, in actual fact, it goes back a year earlier because I had actually been given the Ensign drive in 1979 when Derek Daly left the drive because it was a crap car. I'll drive anything, me. <laughs> and I actually got given the drive. So what should have made my Grand Prix debut in the middle of 79. Uh, and then I didn't get the super license. Yeah. So another great saga of life, and I mean I, that was the most traumatic time of my life, because um, it was we all remember, remember the Bernie Ecclestein versus the FIA versus Balestra War, the famous FIA Foca War. Well, the French had come up with a new super. It was the first year of super licenses because they wanted to try and make sure you you were a capable driver to race in Formula One. But they'd written the rules. The French had written the bloody rules. And you had to come in the top five in ten Formula 3 races or six Formula 2 races or something. Something like that. <laughs> so I said, well, I've done lots of those. I qualified easily in Formula, Formula 3. I'd done finished second in the Formula 1 car. But it, all of a sudden, unfortunately, the regulations, it was, it was international Formula 3 races. Now, the British Championship in 77 was the world centre of motorsport. You know, as I said, PK was there, Chico Serra, Warwick. Everyone came to Britain to do Formula 3, and that actually made it, an, to make it cheaper to run, because when you run a race, you have to pay the, the, the body to have the permit. So they made it a national championship. So all the foreign drivers had to get British licenses to race in the British Formula 3 championship. So Balestra just said, well, they don't, none of my results counted, because they were all national races, and it had to be international. So I was actually declined the super license and didn't get my Grand Prix debut in 79, which would have been with Ensign. So I had Ensign connections and Unipark connections. So eventually when Mike Fackwell turned it down, some drivers too fussy, aren't they? Uh, I was shoehorned in. And in fact, again, it was Mike Black who was here. I mentioned earlier with Unipark who was, who was helping me and advising me. Because I'd actually driven out to Zolder to watch Mike Fackwell testing, hoping I might have my helmet and overalls in the car. It was my Ford Capri. 1.6 litre orange Ford Capri full of rust. I drove back to Zolder to watch Mike Thackwell and he didn't get in the car. And then I drove back to Nürburgring where it was a Formula 2 race the next weekend to try and put my name into a Formula 2 car because I didn't have a drive at the time. And uh, literally Mike phoned me up in, in Germany to say, get home quick. You know, and The little Ford Capri has never driven so fast back from, from Germany to um, a, a, a half a day's test at Donington and then I was in the Belgian Grand Prix. And, and I think, is this, is this practice? I think the race was dry, wasn't it? Yeah, that was the second qualifying, I think yeah, it was wet. Yeah, and but, I, was, I remember watching it live, actually, and uh, the TV cameras were obviously following the, the cars at the front, but then I, I remember feeling uh, very disappointed for you when uh, obviously the engine went after a few laps yeah. and the, the TV cameras got you pulling into the side <laughs> and, and that was it. Oh, off, there it goes, and no, dear, that's Tiffany Dell. What a shame then. <laughs> oh, Murray, Murray, what a wonderful man. But it was the, I mean, you know, the, the thing is, I became a Grand Prix driver, which to me, just that one race, I did try to qualify at Monaco, as I said, but there. Yeah, so we, we have a picture of you, here you are at Monaco again, we, a few weeks later. But you later. know, Regan Zoni only qualified 23rd. You, they took 30 cars, you said, it was great days, those pre qualifying days. So lots of drivers could come in rubbish cars and try to qualify for a Grand Prix. And I managed to qualify 23rd out of the 24 starters, which is the same place the regular Zoni had. So I thought, well, I don't know a reason about a job. You know. The trouble was it was only a single car team, so there was no comparison with a young driver or experienced driver. 
But it ended up with me sitting on the back row of the grid for the 1980 Belgian Grand Prix. And right alongside me was none other than Emerson Fittipaldi. Again, one of my schoolboy heroes I watched in Formula 3. I still remember sitting there going, me, Emerson Fittipaldi, me, Emerson Fittipaldi. In fact, Keke Rosberg was right in front of me, so it was quite a quality back row of the grids in Belgium. <laughs> and um, I still remember when the mechanics started the engine and left me sitting there, and I, thought, I probably should have been thinking of some amazing tactics to do or worried about my start. And I actually sat there going, and I said, Emerson Fittipaldi, I mean, and I suddenly went, started humming in my head. I remember humming, boom, da da boom, ba 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 boom, boom. <laughs> And literally, I think I thought I was still watching on television. This has all happened. This is about one week of my life. This had happened from rushing home uh, in my tatty Ford Capri to sitting on the green with Emerson Fittipaldi. And, uh, yes, for 12 glorious laps, I battled with Emerson Fittipaldi, the honour of being last in the 1980 Belgian Grand Prix. <laughs> and the bloody engine broke. Went to Monaco, 30. Then he took the fastest 20 at Monaco. I actually qualified 19th in the wet. That's not a wet show. I was actually on the grid on the Thursday qualifying. Uh, one place behind some kid, Alan Prost, again, was one place behind at Rosberg. But it dried out and the car wasn't quick enough and um, I didn't make the cut for the, the Monaco Grand Prix. And then the team manager had been asked to Jan Lammers, who was a star at Long Beach when Riggers only was injured. So they wanted Jan Lammers in and um, Jan Lammers got in and then he didn't qualify for six races on the trot. So, no, he, um, he, he didn't do any better in, in a very no. difficult car. But it didn't get me back in. That's always the frustration. You know, you look back and say, you know, I did as good a job as anyone, but it doesn't ever get you back in. So is, is that ensign, is it, I think it's still racing in historic Formula One. Yeah, yeah. I you, still see it crazy. I've got a lovely photograph of me and my sons with it. It's still the most beautiful Formula One car ever, as far as I'm concerned. It's just still just magical memories. I'm driving just to drive around Monaco in a Grand Prix car. You know, even though I wasn't qualified, that, that opportunity to actually be racing in a Grand Prix. And when I go down to Monaco now, I, I sometimes almost believe I didn't do it. Was I making that up? You know, did I actually drive in a Grand Prix qualifying session with, you know, all those heroes around me? And uh, it's just a fabulous remember memories, you know, of going up that hill just from San and Look, it felt like you were in a rocket ship heading for the sky because you're just climbing uphill and you can't see where you're going. So it was a fantastic thing. So obviously it was disappointing for you that uh, the Formula One career didn't progress at that time, but uh, many years ago now, have you put that all to rest now? I mean, you had a great career doing all sorts well, yeah, of other things. I was, I was so lucky because, you know, I went on to race so many different weird things. You know, they're always cheap deals. I never got into the best team or the best car at the right time, you know. But, you know, I raced at Daytona, and, you know, looking, you're looking at the winner of the 1984 Bangalore Grand Prix, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, you know, it was sports cars that, that, that I got lucky, really, because, you know, I did some weird races, but this Group C period happened in 1982, just when I'd sort of come out of the hoping to be a Grand Prix driver, uh, and I'd raced once in an Ibec, a privately entered car at Le Mans, made my Le Mans debut, and then the Aston Martin Nimbra, I got paid to race. Um, that tried to kill me, but that's another story. <laughs> and then I raced factory Toyotas, the M Aston Martin, which I led Le Mans briefly in 1985, which was the last, last Aston Martin engine to lead Le Mans. So I've still got a little, one little tick. But uh, yeah, I raced in Macau in Formula Atlantic and out in racing Japan a lot. So, you know, I was just a have helmet, will travel, you know, journeyman racing driver. Yeah, certainly your, your, your great years really in racing were in, 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 in the Group C. And, of course, this is the car in which uh, you had your, your best finish at Le Mans. Yeah, the wonderful Alpha Porsche. Because, again, that was a, oh, a Japanese side. I went out to Japan sort of mid-80s because they were paying good money out there. So there was, the Japanese scene was great for European drivers because they wanted to bring some hot shots over from Europe to put up against their local guys. Uh, so you could earn quite good money, which got better and better just after I left, as usual. You know, I was the pioneer. There was about three of us out there. 1979, there was about three of us out there doing it. And then I got into... They had their own uh, Group C sports car championship, so I had money racing for them. Then they entered me into Macau races. So Japan was my sort of second home for about 10 years uh, in the mid-'80s. Backwards and forwards on the cheapest plane I could find. And uh, eventually, this, I was racing this uh, Alpha team in the Japanese Championship in 1990. And uh, Derek Bell was with me out there. So we were racing, both sort of earning money, having a bit of a go. And the Japanese owner wanted to go to Le Mans to race. So uh, he put the entry in and we took the privately entered car. Um, and it was a bit of a story, one of my great, brilliant idea, his, history stories. Because it was the first year without the lovely Mulsanne Strait. 
which is a bit of a bug because I used to enjoy the straight because I always thought I was really good on straights. One of my <laughs> fortes. I could be as quick as anyone. Um, but 1990 was the first year with the, with the straight in terms of the chicanes. But I looked at the map of the new chicanes and we were racing in Fuji Speedway all the time. And I realised that the Fuji Speedway straight was the same length as the, each of the three sections. And it was this, the, the factory Porsche team said we must have a low profile still for Le Mans. They still thought it would be a low down force circuit. And also they loved selling because it was a whole new bodywork kit. And of course there were about 20 Porsche 962s then. And the cost of the front and rear bodywork for Le Mans was substantial. Um, and I, I was convinced it would, it would be a high down force would work better. So our Japanese owner actually bought the low downforce kit, but I bought it a special high, thin rear wing. And we tested around Fuji and worked out that it was just as quick with the high downforce, but easier through the corners. So we were one of only two Porsches that started with a high downforce setup. And uh, that made us um, beat the factory Porsches, which was one of the most satisfying. Because <laughs> Derek Bell had left us, to, to, because he was a factory driver for Le Mans, so he wasn't with us in the Japanese car. So I got Anthony Reid and David Sears, two young British drivers like me, that had sort of struggled to get up the ladder, but not got a decent drive or anything. Uh, so I got them to join me. So it was three amateurs. Um, and we just drove our heart out, this flipping thing, for 24 hours. And I have this huge credit. This American crew chief was running us in Japan. And he was a mechanic himself. He rebuilt the whole car himself, made a few modifications for reliability. In fact, did a couple of things that the factory Porsche broke down on, so he'd seen the thing. And he had little Japanese mechanics running around changing the wheels. And the car just ran faultlessly for 24 hours. And we, we rose from that 24th on the grid to finish third. And it was just, um, and it was the whole rest of the top six, the two silk cut Jaguars beat us. Uh, then behind us was the factory Porsche with Derek Bell in it. Uh-huh. Then the factory Toyota and the factory Nissan. So the top six, I and mean, Group C then in 1990 was absolutely you know, huge, huge were global formula. So uh, it was a wonderful achievement and so proud that we, we got it there. So I mean, about, previously, you know, the, the Lamour, that was about my 10th Lamour by then before I got on the podium. Well, I know what Jeremy Clarkson describes you as uh, the, the, the racing driver who once finished third in a big race. Yes, that's how he sums up my <laughs> entire career. Yeah. <laughs> Here's Tiff, who finished, finished third in, for once in a big race. But Le Mans, Le Mans for me was just a huge revelation because I mean, the trouble is I'm, I'm rare as a racer. I'm literally I'm the kid from the terraces you know, who got on the pitch. You know, not many racing drivers have, have been car fans like I was, clinging to a fence you know, in their youth. You know, James Hunt, sort of, someone suggested, why don't you try racing when he was about you know, 20 years old? And so, well, well, I'll try that, old boy. And off he went. But you know, I'd clung to the fence. So I loved the history of racing. So to go to Le Mans, which you know, all my heroes, Clark, and raced at, and, and to go into those same pits, the great concrete bunkers, and ring down to the Mulsanne pit signalers and things like that, that I was so lucky that I did. And whistling down that Le Mans straight at 230 miles an hour through the kink at the end. It was a fabulous circuit. Well, still is. I mean, except it's ruined by the stupid chicanes. But, uh, but of course, the Nimrod, I had that big crash in 1982 when the rear wing fell off the back of the Nimrod, which is a bit of... Ex- I mean, it's interesting. It shows you how, when you're racing, how adrenaline and concentration works. Whenever I say to people about road safety or something, the only thing I'd tell you all to do is to, is to concentrate on what you're supposed to be doing is driving the bloody car. So get off your phone, even if it's hands-free, because when you're talking on the phone, your brain's not there. And I'm the same as everybody else. You know, if I'm doodling along, thinking about what I'm going to say, or tuning the radio, or doing the sat-nav, and someone pulls out in front of me, I sort of swerve and miss them. And then 100 yards down the road, you know, I'm all jelly-legged, and I'm shocked, you know, because something's happened that I wasn't expecting to, because I wasn't concentrating 100% on the driving. Because as racing drivers, that's all you do. You just concentrate 100% all the time. And added to that fact, you've got this wonderful adrenaline pumping through your veins. So funny enough, when things go wrong, or when you crash, you see these huge crashes. We all jump out, don't we? Run back to the pits, get in another car and go out again. You know, Derek Warwick and Monza when he was sliding down the road upside down in his Formula One car. But you don't get shocked. It's a weird thing, because I've seen others on telly that think, God, he'll be shocked, he'll fall into a blubber. But you don't, so you have this concentration because adrenaline makes your reactions faster. So when things go wrong, it's amazing. Everything goes in this, this sort of slow motion. So when I was doodling down the straight 200 miles an hour with the Nimrod, there was this little tiny vibration, a brrrr, then a big boom, and it just turned sharp right. <laughs> so I'm now doing 200 miles an hour looking at a glistening barrier about 10 yards away, thinking, well, I don't want to hit that. So I sort of put on the opposite lock, and it, and it spun away from that barrier. And I remember sort of congratulating myself on my fast reactions and missing the barrier. 
and realised I'm now doing about 190 miles an hour, going backwards down the Mulsanne Strait. Uh, and we all know that you know, steering backwards isn't really that easy, so um, I clobbered the barrier at the other side. And again, this all happened, this took about five minutes instead of five seconds. And when I hit the barrier backwards, the front of the car came right up in the air, and I thought, I'm in the trees, I'm gone. Uh, but it amazingly, it came crashing down, I spun across the road. There was this lovely moment when it was going round and round, and I, I could see all this debris and smoke when I looked one way, then nothing, then smoke, and then nothing. And I realised that both the gullwing doors had blown off on the first impact. I remember saying to myself, that's good, at least when it stops, I'll be able to get out. <laughs> and that is literally a thought that was going through my brain before I hit the barrier on the other side of the road about 100 miles an hour, and it all ground to a halt like an aircraft accident. I jumped out, popped off, went back to the pits. It's a weird thing. Concentration is such a value when you're trying to not crash. So we, we mentioned the, uh, the dreaded, Mr. <laughs> dreaded Mr. C here. You are having a, fr a frank exchange of views. Now, there, there, there must be a couple of anecdotes about uh, Jeremy Clarkson that you can uh, share with us. Well, the, very few, the trouble is we didn't meet that much in the early days because we, we'd filmed individually and stuff. But, uh, of course, I got the top gig called, what, 1987 because I've been doing writing magazine stories. I did anything to try and earn a bit more money, so I was a track tester for Autosport. Then I'd been alongside Murray Walker, the nicest man I've ever met in the world. I was called in... That was from Top Gear, really, to, to be the voice. That was before Top Gear, of course. I was the ex, one of the early expert analysts when um, James Hunt was in the Formula One, but Grant said a lot of Formula Two and Formula Three and Rallycross, and James couldn't be bothered to do those stuff. So um, the BBC got me in because they'd seen my writing and stuff. And um, so I'd been on Top Gear, about 1987, and then Jeremy joined about a year later to bring his humour to it, and uh, we all got along. It was a lot of fun, but he is quite a character. But it's best summed up, really, the only story that, that's, that's almost usable. <laughs> <laughs> because we started those stage shows, because the magazine was launched in the mid-90s, and we had about six million watching then. It was as big as it ever got, you know, and it, with, with um, Quentin Wilson, of course, oh, and yeah, Clarkson and me. We were on the stage in Birmingham, then London, for the motor shows, and it's a live show, five times a day, the whole two weeks. So we used to live in Birmingham, and that's when we got to know each other very well, how much, money, how much you all drank every night. And um, there was one awful w weekend, and I don't know why he did it, because we were going to Birmingham, and he was writing one of his columns, as he started to be a big columnist then, and he decided to write a column about Birmingham the day before we were going to live there for two weeks. <laughs> and he likened Birmingham to a rugby player's bath with a plug pulled out. <laughs> Empty in the middle with a ring of scum on the outside. <laughs> so we're now going to Birmingham. Jeremy, when we all got there, Jeremy, we, we, that, so we, all the restaurants, we got some, we all laughed about it at the end, but uh, he's quite a character. I mean, I love his farm show. I mean, obviously he gets a bit bigger for his boots sometimes, but uh, yeah, we had a lot of fun together. Well, you, you brought that unique blend of uh, you know, the, the presenter and the racing driver to, uh, to, to Top Gear and other, other TV. And I know James May, a bit more kindly, he said, you're, you're, you're the best guy living that can drive and talk at the same time. <laughs> well, I, I, remember, I remember watching you one time, this is some years ago, and possibly a Jaguar, certainly a Group C car, you're at Silverstone and you're going along. You yeah. went, I remember you going oversteer in, oversteer out, you're like 150 miles an hour sliding this car and talking at the same time. I mean, how do you do that? Well, I know, it does seem to be a ridiculous thing I'm able to do. Well, that was what got me onto Top Gear, really, because that Formula First racing car back in 1987, uh, Chris Goffey was supposed to drive it, but he broke his ankle uh, skating, so he couldn't drive it for an item on Top Gear. So as I said, they'd, they'd read my stories in Autosport, so they got me in uh, for this one test. I was only going to do it once, just to the driving for Chris Goffey. And I'd watch telly like we all do, and I thought, it always looks a bit easy, doesn't it? It looks a bit just, oh, you know, go around the corner, it looks too easy. So li literally, before I did that test, I said, what I'll do is I'll flick it sideways to make it look a bit more on the ragged edge. And, of course, talk at the same time. So that was the first thing I did, that very first test, which then set me up to do that for the rest of my life. Uh, and it was a unique thing that the BBC loved, and they thought, well, how can I do that? How can I? I don't know how I can do it, I could just keep talking, I suppose, but then, yeah, as you said, I've kept on doing that for about 50 years now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's 87 to now? I've got to work it all out now. Too many years, isn't it? Wow. Yeah, an incredible talent. So, um, 
you then, in uh, 1993, I think you went from sort of... Mo- Who, who's that behind me? Ooh, well, you, you went from sort of being mo- mo- motor racing's Mr. Nice Guy to sort He's of pu- 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 public you. enemy number one. Um, <laughs> maybe you need to set the background to the, to the race. What, what, what's actually going on there? Nige again. Nige coming back to plague my life. <laughs> we thought we got rid of him forever. He went off to America to, after he won the Formula One Championship and then he won the IndyCar Championship and then Ford decided that they ought to welcome Nige home because there was this great toker shootout for touring cars at Donington Park. And um, so I'm sure many of you remember it. Uh, so they gave him a, a Ford Mondeo, which you can see a small part that's still in one piece at this moment of the photograph. Yeah, this, um, this, is, this is Nigel here, so he, he sort of barged his way past you, didn't he? So, yeah, so he, he, I mean, he'd struggled to get rid of this, because I was in this Cavalier, because I'd raced a Nissan, which wasn't competitive, but I finally got this really quick car. David Leslie was my teammate. We were running first and third with Paul Radicic, I think, was second at the time. And it was about a £12,000 prize. For me, this was a massive chance not only to have a good touring car race, but to, to win £12,000. Apparently, Nigel got hundred grand for turning up. Anyway, he battled up through the field because he, he struggled a bit early on, but he was going quick in this Mondeo. And actually, the very next corner after that, down into Redgate, I was well ahead under brake, and I thought, I've got him, I can take the racing line. But he came barging up the inside, escorting me off the road with a lot of clattering. In fact, that, that right-hand door mirror has only got a straight of Redgate left to live on before he took that off. So he clobbered me off the road. So I was then on the grass coming out of Redgate after he'd driven me off the road. And that, like, Steve Soper got by in the BMW, you can see That's him here in the top Steve of shot. Yeah. So they're going down the Craner curves, and you, I can hear the roar of the crowd because you know they're night, and they're all wearing their red five T-shirts and Union Jack flags and tour shorts. The whole night, the sun had got special T-shirts printed, I think, and they were going mad for it. But he, brilliant, he'd come up from about tenth or something. He was now in third place. Nige is going to win the race, and into Redgate Corner, not Redgate, Old Hairpin, Old the Hairpin. bottom of the hill. And the thing went more and more sideways. And we all know with front-wheel drive cars, they, they don't usually come back from that unless you hit the throttle and spin up the front wheels. And anyway, Nigel on board was back. <laughs> if you've seen the on board, but he's huffing and puffing. <laughs> anyway, he was spearing off to the right. So Soper went by him behind him. So I went to follow Soper. Which, and all of a sudden, he, his massive amount of opposite lock took control. And he just turned sharp left and came across in front of me. So I tried to break to avoid him, which is visible on the video, but I just punted him straight off. And, um, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it, yeah. it, was a, it was a hell of an impact. I mean, he it, hit that wall it, really hard. Yeah. Anyway, it was... <laughs> <laughs> We all knew, his, in fact, everyone knew it was perfectly normal because when the marshals got to him, apparently he was lying there, he said, Don't touch me, I'm unconscious. <laughs> so, so we all knew Nigel wasn't really too badly injured. Anyway, by the time we all sat on the grid waiting for a restart and waiting for ambulances and helicopters, there were a few spectators started coming along on the other side of the track giving me some weird looking signs. So I'd been responsible for this outfit. But yes, I was the man that put Nigel into the Donington Wall. Most famous. Things I'm most famous for. I'm not really in <laughs> no, no, you, you must have crossed paths with Nigel since then. Do, do, do you ever discuss it when, you, when you've seen him? Not really, no. <laughs> <laughs> He's too busy telling me how good his golf is and that sort of thing, you know. Oh, I'm good at golf. I'm good at that. I'm good at that. I'm good at ping pong. Did you know that? Yeah. Do you play ping pong, Tiff? I'm good at ping pong. <laughs> Amazing character. Amazing. Oh, great. It's, it's funny how I was compared. To, it's quite interesting thinking of Nige and how drivers... Cause it's amazing how different talents... We always talk about the great naturals like Jim Clark or Ayrton Senna or Schumacher. But see, Nige wasn't a great natural talent. And it's this ability that different... St- tiles of talent. Because, see, Damon Hill wasn't really a great natural talent. But you, I always put there's a sort of element of natural ability with hard work and sort of hooliganism. And you can put the three, like Keke Rosberg was 90 percent hooligan, you know, and, and Ronnie Peterson, you know, had this amazing style but didn't care about the setup of the car, just wrung its neck. And I was like, like the thing when I was at Monaco in the Formula One car. And it's amazing, when you first go on a track like that and you're sort of a bit out of your depth, it's all about this where your mind, when I was going into the the next quarter at Monaco, the first dozen or so laps, my sort of brain was still at the quarter before, thinking, what the hell happened there? And where has that barrier gone? You know, it's like your, your, your body's ahead of you with the car. And gradually, my brain would catch up. So my best sort of moments, the, my brain was about six inches behind my body, so I was just about keeping up with it. And Nigel's a driver. He literally works 
at the moment, his, his brain is with the body and the car, so he just reacts to whatever goes on. And I always liken how I explain how the, the Senna's and Schumacher's are, are so, um, and Hamilton's, is that their mind is actually ahead of their body. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. how they're so far more natural and relaxed. They're not resting the car ever. Yeah. They've yeah. got the th corner sorted before the car gets there. But Nigel was probably the best at just wrestling a car. Amazing strength. And, and well, moving away from the tracks and into rallying, I mean, it's interesting. I, I, again, I, I do a bit of rallying, and obviously you did uh, rallying with, with, with pace notes. And it's a little bit like that as well, isn't it? Because I always explain to people when you're driving, you're driving the corner and you're actually driving that corner at the moment and controlling the car, but you're also listening to your co-driver yes. telling you about the next corner. Stupid idea. <laughs> <laughs> You, you, you've almost, your brain's almost running in parallel. So, so this, was a, this was an outing in the... Um, that was the second uh, one. That was the icy one. That was, that was, that was the one when uh, the, uh, you woke up to a sheet ice across, across yeah. England. My first, my, that's my first rally. G. I, did a, I did one rally with Top Gear with Tony Mason. I did a little club rally. I won it. I won my first rally. I thought, this is easy. It was a one-make series of Ford RS 2000s or 200s, 2000s, uh, and won it. And then my next rally, having done one club rally, was the Rally GB in a Group N uh, Escort Sierra Cosworth. And I had the lovely Tina Turner, the um, mm. Swedish female navigator, who was with Louise Aitken Walker, the one the Women's Championship. Um, but basically, it meant that for, for three days of this rally, or four days, I had to listen to a woman talking to me and do what she told me to do. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> it's a nightmare. <clears throat> Oh, she was lovely, Tina. But that was, it, it, it is a thing, these pace notes. I mean, then nowadays, it's just ridiculously frightening. And there's a the Craig Breen crashed, if you've seen a video, you know, he was testing his Ford down in for Monte Carlo Rally coming up in two weeks' time. And the speed they're going through, one small, tiny error, and but he I, pinged I, the walls. But I remember reading that the, uh, the, the Skoda didn't like the ice very much, you know, coming down these hills, and even with your car control and handbrakes on, you no just chance. You, inevitably you're in the ditch at the, at the bottom of the hill. It gets worse than that, because the bloody spectators kept on digging me out of the ditch and putting me back on the track. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, funny enough, it was, it was a rag, because Stig Blomkus was in a Skoda, and he was, like, running third overall, and I was, I was with all the amateurs at the back, so obviously you get seeded. And the worst thing is, in fact, it's actually the poor old amateurs have a worse surface, because you can't have studs. RIC really had to rub. You're not allowed any, any special uh, spud studs. But, of course, the front runners would actually grab whatever snow there was and polish everything up. So the whole track was just more and more polished. And literally, well, we were coming to little crests, and you see spectators waving you on. And, yeah, I know what you're up to here, because you know <laughs> what's over the crest is downhill. And you literally go, oh, pressing all the pedals, pulling all the levers, and bump into the ditch. And, then, and these little faces appear on the wind. Oh, Jeff, yeah, Jeff, Jeff, get him out. No, leave me here. Just please leave me <laughs> but, but one... The one true story that sums up to me ridiculous racing in the ice, that we were going up these hills, and we front wheel drive about five miles an hour. Can I get to the top of the hill even? But all of a sudden, these bloody headlights were catching me, and there's a bit of etiquette in rallying. If you do get caught, you have to sort of slightly move over and let someone by on the stage. So I sort of move as much as I could to the side. And the first thing I saw was a young girl pulling a rope, overtaking me. <laughs> and it was the Simonite sisters, the famous, they did a lot of off-roading, they were doing a rally in the same rally on that event. And literally, the sister had got out, and they planned this a rope, and the only way they could overtake me was she was pulling her sister up the hill. So I was overtaken at a world championship event by a girl pulling another girl up a hill. <laughs> Embarrassing life. But at least I finished. I did finish. I survived that ridiculous, ridiculous conditions that year. Shot off the road more times than I can remember. So, so you then sort of turned full circle and met many, many years later you tracked down your original Lotus yeah. and, and you bought it back again. How, how, how on earth did you, did you find it and where, where had it been all those years? Well, I sold it to, to Austria, a dodgy cash deal. Because I'd had it for two and a half years and it was bent as anything. And again, it was how I got up my career because... I raced that for two and a half years, did fairly well. Then I got offered a cost price chassis, which allowed me to sell the Lotus so I could just about keep going. And Eldon gave me a cost price chassis. So I sold it to a bloke in Austria who'd come over and seen it. And Lotus 69 was a popular car in Austria. And he actually flew me, he didn't give me any money. And I had to put the car in a mate's transporter that was racing in Austria. And I hadn't got any cash. Oh, terrifying moments. But he paid my airfare, so I flew out to Vienna, and he gave me the cash at a car park in Vienna, and I was waiting <laughs> to get mugged, and oh, I flew home, little innocent, I was about 22 by now, never been overseas before, I don't think, hardly, and got the cash to come out. So anyway, I'd sold it to Austria, 
Then I heard it being off the edge of a hill climb and it was dead forever. But anyway, suddenly I was actually on a plane, weird story, on a plane going on a holiday and this bloke came up to me and he said, I've got your car. Right. I said, well, how can you? It's written off. But no, it came back to it. The bits came back to it. It's got the same chassis number, but, it's, it, but it's, <laughs> none of the bits that I sold are still on it. He's got a new chassis and new suspension, and, uh, but it's the same chassis, but the gearbox is the same chassis number. So it was my car, and uh, I resisted buying it for about five or six years, and then I had to have it in the end. Had to, it had to come home. So I sold it for about one and a half grand and bought it back for 30. So it <laughs> wasn't the best deal I've ever done, I don't think. But the lovely thing is that I had my first ever race. This is a great pub quiz song, pub quiz question. So I had my very first race win in that car in 1972 at Thruxton. And in about 2014, uh, over 40 years later, I won a historic Formula Ford race at Thruxton. So same driver, same car, winning a race at the same circuit with about a 40-year gap. Must yeah, be yeah, quite I'm a good show. Yeah. 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 It's, it's been such a joy to race it again, you know, because the Formula Fords, I mean, you wear them, you know, and you can just about touch the front wheels and your little tiny cockpit, and every little tiny reaction on the steering is so precise. And you, as I said, I prepare it myself. I set it up still like I did, change the gear ratios. I always remember the first time when I won the car back in Weybridge, um, I'd had a friend with a bit of pen and paper and I pulled the gearbox apart for the first ever time and he wrote down the order the bits fell out so I could just about <laughs> get them back in in the same order. But, um, yeah, I've raced it about well, 20 times since I've had it back and uh, it's just an absolute joy. So in terms of racing, you're, you're, you're still doing, of course, you're, you're very much a Goodwood favourite and here you are leading the... I've forgotten what the race is. Yeah, one of my favourite photos ever. That's the Sussex Trophy. Sussex Didn't win trophy. the bloody race, of course. Tony Drong. We were mentioned Tony Drong. He only died just recently. An absolutely lovely man. Great journalist. Oh. Very fast driver who actually had the Unipart drive and a bit embarrassing. In the Dolomite sprint, yeah. He was, had it solo on his own in 1976. Mm. And Ian Taylor was already shoehorned in for they were going for two cars. And Tony was actually helping me, introduce me to the team to try and get me in with him. And it ended up with me getting the drive, but he didn't get it at all. So he lost his drive. It was very awkward, but Tony, we've always laughed about it since. But uh, that's him in second. He won the race, Peter Harmon and, the, and Wizzo Williams in 29. But it's just such a great Goodwood shot. Yep. And, and I, uh, I, I mean, the first time that I, again another great Top Gear story you can see on see all these on YouTube now, uh, Top Gear Goodwood Tiff, beautifully produced, directed. I mean, Top Gear had the budget, and the money, and wonderful director did it. It's a beautiful item about Goodwood. I raced that car for the first time, and I did have tears in my eyes at the end of that because you know when I first turned up to the, the paddock on that very first Goodwood, I just walked in. You know, I was living my childhood, and it's. I've actually had a photo commission, a photo painting commissioned that I've now got at home. Um, because I actually called, there was a handicap race and Sterling Moss was racing the car he won the TT in, in 1959. And I caught him up in that list and overtook him. Uh, but I had a painting done of me coming into the chicane at, at Woodcote. And I caught Moss up. But the, I had the background painted in the sort of 59 grandstand chicane style. And so one of the little pink dots of all the faces in the grandstand is me. <laughs> and I, so I'm in, it, I'm in the and picture also in twice. The so yeah, I'm, yeah. And also and then I'm driving. So it, it is the dream because I was that little pink dot watching Sterling Moss win the 59 Tourist Trophy. Yeah. And then well, there I am on the track racing him in, the, in that car against uh, Sterling. Well, we, we have raced each other once, Tiff. I, I don't think uh, you, 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 we really connected on the I day. I apologise now already of whatever no, I did. No, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> It, so you, you, it was in the Sumeria's Trophy in 2012. You, you were in a Jag. You were in a, I was going to put up the results sheet, but uh, I did beat you, but you did break down. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah. But that weekend, I mean, it's just ridiculous what March has done. To that, mm. The money spent getting it going, the money now makes keeping it going. But uh, it is incredible the way he's, he's recreated it all and the way the fans turn up and they wear the clothes from the 50s and the 60s and, you know, voluntarily. And the atmosphere of the whole thing is just the most magical thing. I don't know how many I've done them all now, but when did it start? I must have been at 20. 98. 1998 yeah. it started. So, yeah. I've done every one of those and uh, hope, hopefully continue to do so. It's just mm -hmm. one of my weekends of the year. Okay. Even if I have to play cricket the day before, it's a bit embarrassing. I got 29 this year before I got out. Yeah. 
And I think you have another Goodwood story. I think it must be the members meeting, uh, fighting with Tom Christensen on the, uh, on, on the last lap in the, yes, in the, in the Rovers. Yes, Tom Christensen, he always gets the best card. <laughs> <laughs> we were both in Rover three and a half litres, and I overtook him in a wood on the last lap to get him. I had another great last lap battle last year with young Marino Franchitti banging doors. We went to the chicane hitting each other, and he had to go left because I was half a car length on the right. So, so another, another thing you, you get up to these days, you get to behave like a, like a bit of a hooligan at uh, Thruxton three, three or four days a week. That's the fact that I'm still last, a man of all jobs, still earning a dollar or two here. Yeah, passenger rides at Thruxton. Want anyone to come and sit beside me three laps of the video, sideways, 140 miles an hour. Yeah. I'd take four year olds on booster seats and 84 year olds with Zimmer frames. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Stick you in a passenger seat and let you laugh, cry, or scream for three laps. And I've now done 7,000 rides over the last 10 years doing that. It's amazing. So 7,000 rides, three laps. So that's um, that's 21,000 laps of trucks to burning Pirelli's tyres to shreds. Yeah. So I, I enjoyed it. It's amazing, really. I mean, nobody, you know, everyone, you do laugh, cry, or scream. I don't really care which, but you know. The biggest thing is that so many um, normal-ish people just said they couldn't believe that a road car could do that. They're almost staggered. They cannot believe mm-hmm. what a well, car could do. I remember following you into the chicane a couple of times. You were, let's say, a little bit sideways. <laughs> that's, that's just, that's just about, it's a lot of fun. I do enjoy doing that. Okay, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Tiffany Dell. I'm getting a bit serious there, aren't I? I'm a bit serious there. So there's obviously lots and lots of things we didn't touch on. We barely touched on modern racing and so forth, but uh, I assume we're going to have a few questions. And we've got Mike here on hand. Does anybody like to uh, ask Tiff a question? Indeed. Thank you, Tiff. And thank you, Harry. Um, It's been a most enjoyable evening. Can can I actually start with a question? Sir. What's your favourite car? My favourite car? Well, McLaren F1, but I can't afford one now. <laughs> I remember when I did that film for, for Top Gear, I, I remember I could have sold the house and bought McLaren F1. And I wish I had done now, because you could have used about £16 million pounds now. Now, road car, it has to be rear-wheel drive for me, you know, so it's BMWs. But I love BMWs. I mean, they are, they are, they are drivers, they were the driver's car. They're getting more and more soggy now and heavier, unfortunately. Everything's getting heavier and hybrided and four-wheel driven and all that rubbish. But uh, Porsche's BMW, rear-wheel drive. Put, put another way, Tiff, maybe, are you worried about the state of Formula One uh, going forward? Well, yes, yeah, still worried, because they're still bloody great articulated lorries, aren't they? The whole problem is the size. This, you know, these hybrids brought all the batteries and the weight. They're just so long and heavy that you can't really have frisky fun when you watch you know, any of Formula One cars from five years ago or more. You know, the, the driver's much more in control. Um, and I'm very worried about the new regulations. We're all hoping the new regulations are going to follow closely and overtake. But already they were talking about the DRS. It's going to be used, it was sort of assumed when they mentioned one track, oh, it'll be better if the DRS they can adjust the length for next year. I thought it wasn't going to have DRS this year, that it was going to be without the boxy things. So um, I'm very worried that we're still going to have DRS. There's still heavy articulated lorries and it, it won't change much. So, and it all depends on the whole future thing and the obsession with being nice to manufacturers. And my vision is more of an IndyCar vision albeit with more privateers and more of, you know, a, the, we, we'll just... I think in, 19, in sort of 2060, we should be like gladiatorial entertainment, like Goodwood is now, that we could run Formula One with full-on V10 petrol engines, artificially created petrol that's green, uh, and just have noisy piston engine, lightweight racing cars. Um, otherwise, you know, if people always say Formula One must be the peak of science. Well, they don't even have ABS on the cars. They're not really the peak of science now, are they? And actually, if you follow the peak of science, then they'll, they'll all be autonomous anyway, so we won't have drivers at all. <laughs> so, so, yes, I'm still worried, because we've still got DRS, and while that's there, it's not very pure racing. Um, so, see how it goes. Dark. Yeah, the next question is from the, uh, the back here. Um, if I say OTT 365, that may take you back a few years from the school times. 
Three six five. He's a bit ancient, isn't he? Who's my, that? My, my question is, um, following on from your recent uh, uh, um, observations, is your, your thoughts and uh, on the way forward regarding electric side of things and, and uh, general cars in general and and racing. We I don't mind it as long as it's not forced upon me. I mean, I'd, I'd happily commute an electric car if I had a plug at home and a plug at work. You know, because when you're just doing the daily chores. I don't really mind it, it hasn't got a piston engine, but I mean, the weekends or for fun or for enthusiasts or for, you know, it's just no fun at all. They're just like driving a refrigerator. They're just sort of <laughs> nothing in them. There's no heart beating. So there's no driving enjoyment. And I think people are, they, they turn a blind eye to the enthusiasts out there that, you know, do like playing with their cars and, and, and modifying them and enjoying them. The trouble is, when I talk about handling, I mean, you have to accept there's only about 5% of the buying public do care whether a car handles or not. You know, 95% probably are happy just buying a, a fridge and driving it. <laughs> Who's OT? I'm OT836 then. How many other OTs? Ottershaw's boarding school, this is. We're talking numbers, by the way. Both of my schools have been shut down. I was at Wallop School, Weybridge, that's now a housing estate. And I was at Ottershaw boarding school, that's also a housing estate. Shame, really. Going back to your racing uh, career, Tiff, do you have a sliding doors moment where you wished you'd gone through the other door? Different door? Mm. Yeah, I want to be a professional golfer. That's much easier. <laughs> but nothing in a racing where you think you'd, if you'd taken a different decision, something... Oh, too many of those, yeah. I mean, would, uh, if I'd shot a couple of drivers, I kept on thinking... <laughs> <laughs> running someone over. I was always so close. The number of drivers, you know, I was second on the list, you know and that your whole life would be completely different. There's no doubt about it. I, mean, I remember I had a, a contract with the Japanese to race in their Porsche, the first Porsche 956 before the 962, the one and only car going to Japan. And I had our contract, and I went off to Daytona to try and hang around the Daytona 24 hour race to try and get a drive there. And while I was there, my mum said that some Japanese had phoned and he was in England and couldn't see me. And by the time I got home, I tried a text saying, sorry, Vern Schupen's driving it. And literally, um, the works team were dumping Vern Schupen. And so I think when the Japanese went to the factory to have a talk about their car, they'd sort of probably done a deal to save a couple of spare parts. So Vern was in my drive. And Vern then won the championship about three years on the trot. I mean, yeah, and, and Brian Henton ruined my career. I was going to be in the Tolman Formula 2. Two years on the trot, I should have been in the Tolman Formula 2 team. I was like the first reserve, so I was hanging around. I knew them well, the family well. I did one race at Hockenheim and was running third, and that was all looking good. Uh, but then Brian Henton got in my way. So I had him, Brian Henton run over <laughs> for a couple of grand. Um, that was a drive I missed out on big time. There's so many, I was so close. That it's, um, but you don't have the choices in a way. You know, things just, they come on there. I was very lucky. I had the autosport car. I got luck. I got lucked into the Durex car. You know, I got the Unipart drive. So uh, I can't complain, I guess, about the luck I did have in the drives I did get. Yeah, there's a number of examples, as you say, in your book where it just didn't quite go your yeah. way in terms of uh, team choices and what have you. A lot of pacing the floor, waiting for phones. Oh, dear. Hi there. Um, I just wanted to know, I was interested to know what your favourite uh, engine configuration uh, V12. is. V12. V12. <laughs> BMW, right behind my ears in my McLaren F1. <laughs> Second best? Well, V10. Okay. <laughs> I think I know where this is going. Uh, hello, I'd like to know what was the, your favourite car that you ever drove and what was your favourite circuit? Well, the McLaren F1 was, well, that's a road car, but I mean, the Formula 2 March 782, just before Ground Effect came in, was my favourite single-seater racing car when I was running third at Hockenheim. That was the Tolman car I briefly drove. Circuit-wise, I think Macau actually comes out, when I think back, the most amazing circuit. as a street track and the, the precision needed through the whole of the bit at the top. Um, you know, Spa... I never raced at the Nürburgring, fun enough, which is a bit frustrating in my career. Um, not, not in the so Nords life. I mean, you, you raced on the Grand Prix circuit, obviously, quite a few times. Yeah, the yeah, modern yeah, one, yeah, yeah the modern yeah. the Group C sports cars. Yeah. That's the funny thing about Nürburgring. That everyone, everybody loves it, and it's the most amazing circuit to drive around. <laughs> and I realised, actually, the Nürburgring is a never-ending series of corners and one long straight. So, in fact, the Nürburgring, for, for racing, is actually not that good. If you're in a Porsche, you know, a GT2, GT3, a 24-hour race now, they can't overtake for a lap. If you've got two identical cars with identical drivers, it's actually, there's no overtaking places until you get to the great big long straight. So it's quite funny that we all 
hello and pray to this great circuit and we complain there's nowhere to overtake on Tilka circuits. Mm -hmm. But in actual reality, Nürburgring is, is a very poor circuit for, for ability to overtake. Those silly little front wheel drive shopping trolley touring cars, they do three laps for a world championship round and they can't overtake till they all follow around a little trail till they get to the straight. To the big straight, yeah. So another question at the back here. Hello, Tiff. Um, the, the historic cars you race at Goodwood are worth, well, they're priceless. Does it ever concern you how much they're worth when you're sort of trading paint with another dog? No, definitely not. <laughs> I mean, the point is, the main thing is most owners that race them, they, it, it, mending a, an old car or a new car, it's the same cost to, to re-bend the bits of metal. The only real danger is if it catches fire and burns to the ground. Well, then my main worry sometimes is, am I actually racing the real one or is it a replica I parked in a, in a safe down in Bahrain and this is a copy? You never know what you're driving nowadays. But um, no, you, you don't worry about them. We, we mentioned earlier on your, your old uh, ensign. Is there any ever chance of you getting to drive it again, do you think? No, we tried to do it for television. I mean, the trouble is nowadays that there's costs and the insurance and everybody's worried about things breaking because they cost so much money to, re to repair. We, we nearly got close to driving the ensign for fifth gear, but then they said, well, we insure the engine. And uh, well, no, they couldn't because we haven't got the budget to insure the case of the engine. And of course, I mean, he might have over the engine the last lap he drove it. And I drive out the pit lane and it drops a valve and it's a £30,000 rebuild, yeah. which wasn't my fault. Hi, Tiff. Um, quite a few of us do road trips here and there. I'm lucky enough to do Monaco, very happy place to be. All the places that you've been around Europe, what, what's your top three on bucket list places to... For, well, for this a, is good now. I've uh, got some marketing here. If you go to motorpassion.com, <laughs> you'll find there's a brilliant tour. And I, I wrote the itinerary for the Daytona 500. We're going in about four weeks' time. Um, it's, very, it's very expensive, but it's, there's only about 20 guests and, and me and, and the boat for Motor Passion. Uh, we also go to Monaco and Belgian Grand Prix with the same group. Um, they just do some upmarket, very bespoke uh, transport to the circuit and back and um, this day I always wanted to go I did the Daytona 500 for fifth gear I went out for the first time this is the stock car racing you know and it's just I mean everybody jokes about it and you're just turning left it's the most amazing event the way the Americans do events in America they just make your hair stand on the back of your neck because you, you, you go onto the grass in the infield you see all the driver introductions you're sitting in the grass the cars are lined up two feet away from you in the qualifying, you can go and look in the garages. The drivers come up and sign autographs. You can watch the mechanics at work. The access is unbelievable. And the build-up to the race with the old Lord's Prayers and God Bless America and the National Anthem, and they're all standing up with their hearts going. And then when those 44 NASCARs come rumbling around, you know, just at sort of half-throttle on the parade laps, and the tension rising, the jets go over after the National Anthem, then when they first come round at 200 miles an hour, three abreast, and they boom, 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 it is a stunning event. And it's so different. And of course, we go to the beach. We go to a little um, half-mile race track, you know, local track where all the locals, how they all begin NASCAR drive. We, go for, we call it the beer and burger night out, you know, cheap and cheerful. Because they have, they have races at these little half-mile, quarter-mile ovals all over America almost every night of the week. So it's a wonderful trip. So well, that's, the, that's your bucket list. Le Mans, you've done all of them. I mean, Le Mans, obviously. The obvious ones, Le Mans, Spa, uh, you know, are great to go to. Le Mans is a must. If you haven't done Le Mans, obviously, you'd go there and campsite. See who builds the biggest pyramid of beer bottles and <laughs> all, the, all the fun of the fair. So, yeah, think about it. I mean, I haven't done India. Of course, the Indi Indianapolis 500 I'd love to go to because, again, it's the same American razzmatazz and an amazing racing event. You know, so it's, much. it's a pity that the, the Americans on the, the Indy cars, they only now, that's only the only big oval now that they, they, they race on now because of, because of the danger, all of Michigan and all the rest of it. They don't race there anymore. But yeah, they still do Texas, I think. They've still got Texas coming up. There's an oval in Texas. Still quick enough for me. I'm not sure about those ovals. Flipping now. But again, it's, I mean, I'd luck it for Top Gear. I did a NASCAR desk at Charlotte, and it, it's a big skill, but people think it's so simple. And the way the cars are set up, all tricks. So you go down the straights holding it, you're steering right all the way down the straight, then you actually release the steering because it's trying to turn left all the time when you come off the throttle and feather it in. And I did a lap at about 175 miles an hour, and I thought, geez, I had a, I had a kid leading me, you know, to draw me forwards. And towards the end, he was pulling away, and I couldn't stay with him. But, um, <laughs> So you know, other forms of motorsport, I think, you know, I love so much. The Dakar rallies entertain me hugely on the television every night this week. 
Uh, just watching the photograph, photography, and it's the last night, to tonight, tomorrow night, two more nights. Um, so go home, we've got Eurosport, watch things like that. I just love all forms of motorsport, really. Did you or anyone around you ever feel embarrassed or awkward presenting fifth gear? <laughs> what? It's not a very nice question. Do I feel embarrassed or awkward? <laughs> I'm, al I'm always awkward as anyone watching me feel me. I'm now doing love cars, obviously, because the, the Top Gear got sacked from Top Gear and Fifth Gear now. So, yeah, someone on Discovery Channel le left me off Fifth Gear about three years ago, so I'm not doing that anymore. But, yeah, when I'm filming, if anyone's listening to me doing I hate it. I don't want anybody around me when I'm uh, doing my pieces to camera. Um, in all those years of racing, and you've been fantastic o over the years, have you ever really hurt yourself? No, I just broke my arm once. It was actually a little form in the, in the Lotus my, about my second year. And it was a, just a small crash. In fact, I was trying to miss it, putting a lock on. And I hit the wheel to wheel. And the wheel just sn spun in my hand. I went to get out of the car. I thought, oh, that hurts a bit. <laughs> and again, it's lovely to talk about health and safety. I'd, I'd broken the, one of those two, whatever they're called. Tibula. No, tibulars are down there, aren't they? I don't know. One of, one wrong, of those wrong limb, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I went to the autumn part doctors who said, yeah, it's broken, Tiff. So he said, well, you can either go into Liverpool A&E and spend the night there, or if you've got a mate with you, you can drive. So I said, oh, yeah. So he put me in a sling with my broken arm at Alton Park. I had an Anglia van that I moved up from the, uh, moved up from the Morris Stab, Anglia van. And I lay down in the back of the Anglia van. All so he drove me all the way home, and I went to bed in my overalls and checked into Church at St Peter's the next day to have a, and they put a plate in. That was the only broken thing I've had, so... I got lucky, I think. But yeah, sleeping in the Anglia van, again, those stories of Formula Ford days, when I had the Anglia van, was a bit posher. So I would drive to Snetterton from about 3 a.m. And we put half the van at all the tyres and spares, and the other half was a sleeping bag in the back. So my mechanic would sleep all the way up there, so I'd do the scrutineering, do the practice of the race. And I'm, the sleeps I had, getting in the back of those vans, lying in the back when my mechanic drove us home, I've just had the most wonderful sleeps I've ever had. <laughs> jogging along in the back of the Anglia van. Oh, wonderful. Thanks, Tiff. Uh, that, ladies and gentlemen, is all that we have time for this evening. Most importantly, can't possibly forget... Tiff, I think you've got a book for sale, haven't you? Have I? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's about eight or nine years old now. There aren't many left. These are my treasured last couple of boxes I've brought down here. What, two to go. <laughs> So, a, a rare opportunity not to be missed, and he remains to say again, thank you, Tiff. That's my pleasure. And th thank you, Harry. As a former it's been a great trustee, evening. we didn't get on to the fact, of course, I was a Brooklyn we didn't, trustee. We didn't, we didn't get on to that, yeah. Aviation, so, so much variety in my life. I really enjoyed being, a, I was a trustee here for nearly 10 years, especially with Alan Wynn in charge, and uh, getting the hanger off that bloody straight was all we were trying to do for 10 years. <laughs> Poor old Alan was busy he tried to repair rotten stairs and little bits of draining and floods and everything else. And we kept saying, just get that buddy, hang her off, hang her off. <laughs> so I think it's one of the greatest things that Alan did with us was to get the hangar removed because it's transformed Brooklyn, to my mind. And what they've created now is magnificent compared with what we had. And, uh, congratulations yeah. to all that. It's been great to have you back. Thanks for a lovely evening. Cheers. Thank you.